Gary Becker is uh, one of the greatest uh, living economists. He won the Nobel Prize in uh, 1992. Uh, as many of you know, most of you probably know, he's one of the pillars of the so-called Chicago School of Thought, along with uh, such people as Milton Friedman, George Stigler, uh, Jim Heckman, Al Harberger, Harry Johnson, and I'm sure I left off some additional uh, uh, stalwarts in the Chicago School. Gary has an enormous range of interests, including labor economics, education economics, the economics of discrimination, the family, crime, addiction, and immigration. He probably has expanded the domain of economics more than any single scholar in the history of the profession. He is a keen observer of the U.S. and global economy, as we will see over the next hour. Gary and uh, so I should say that uh, CEPR has kind of a policy that we don't uh, sell books at our events, but it doesn't stop me from mentioning uh, Gary's book. Gary and federal appellate judge Richard Posner have been participating in the Becker Posner blog since December 2004. This past fall, they published a book based on the first two and a quarter years of the blog with the title Uncommon Sense. Economic Insights from Marriage to Terrorism. And uh, it looks like this, and uh, if this is the image you get at Amazon.com, you clicked in the right space. Now, uh, this book was published by, who else? The University of Chicago Press. Now, what's unusual about this book, which I enjoyed, it's a 366 page book, but it's got 49 chapters. So you can actually read a chapter 10 minutes, 15 minutes, which is about my attention span. So I thought this was uh, great. And the topics show his incredible range, or his and uh, Richard Posner's incredible range. They deal with topics like the sexual revolution, marriage, gay marriage, immigration reform, organ sales, traffic congestion, tenure at universities, a possible fat tax, CEO compensation, which is not to be confused with the fat tax. Uh, <clears throat> income inequality, post-catastrophe price gouging, Google in China, you get the idea. It covers just about everything. So now I'm going to move over here and ask Gary a range of questions, and uh, we'll see how my questions go. I may need some questions uh, from you uh, as well. So here we go. So first, uh, in the last year, including today, uh, we've had a lot of um, discussion about the uh, credit crisis, the financial crisis, and so forth. And it seems like we've heard a lot of different theories. One theory is that the Federal Reserve was responsible and, uh, in setting inappropriate monetary policy. They kept interest rates too low, too long. They, they had their, they had, it's sort of like Toyota, the accelerator was stuck. Uh, and uh, the result was kind of the same. Uh, another uh, possibility here is that uh, it was really the bank regulators, the failure of regulation. A third possibility we've heard about is maybe the regulators and the top guys like Geithner and, and Bernanke and uh, Paulson, they're the ones who panicked. And they got so scared, they scared Congress and they scared everybody else, and sure enough, we had a, had a problem. Uh, I just wanted to get your assessment of uh, who's to blame. Well, I think partly all of the above, <laughs> plus um, I think the bankers. I mean, so it's a combination. I think the Fed kept interest rates too low for too long. I think the regulators fell asleep at the switch. They had uh, the power to control a lot of things, and they didn't do it. I think the bankers took on a lot of risks. They didn't understand the uh, systemic risk aspects of it. They probably didn't even understand the risk of individual derivative securities, which are, after all, a new phenomenon. Uh, so it's a combination of all these factors, I think, that led to the crisis. Okay, so you're going to see the range, because I'm not going to, each question is not going to be in sequence. Here. Let me add one other okay. thing. Uh, given that, I think the solutions 
and, and, and it's hard to find a, a foolproof solution where we'll never have another financial crisis. Um, I think you can destroy markets and maybe you won't have it. But I, I, so you have to accept there is a probability you will have another crisis. What you want to do is try to reduce the probability that you'll have this crisis significantly. I don't think you can do it by leaving a lot of discretion in the hands of the Fed and of regulators. Because I think this episode shows, as other episodes have shown, my teacher and close friend Milton Friedman described the Great Depression, how the Fed really fell asleep during the Great Depression. I think you have to have uh, more rules-based uh, authority at the Fed and rule-based regulation of both banks, such as higher credit standards, higher credit uh, requirements, maybe especially high credit requirements for the larger, the too, too big to fail institutions. I think that's the lesson, among others, that I draw from this crisis. Now, one of the chapters of the book that I found uh, interesting and, and uh, a little less than mainstream, uh, you argue that uh, increasing inequality in the United States and uh, in some sense, even globally, but in the U.S., let's take the U.S. You argue that increasing inequality in the U.S. may be a good thing. Now, uh, most people, probably that wouldn't be your starting point. And so, could you tell us why we might view increasing inequality as a good thing? Well, to ask, you know, whether inequality is good or bad, or increases in inequality are good or bad, you really, first of all, have to understand what the sources of the increase in inequality is. I think that's the number one question. And uh, depending upon the source, you may say, well, this is really a bad event. We're like uh, shooting craps, and some people gain a lot of money, and some people gain a little bit. That sort of inequality most of us wouldn't uh, particularly appreciate. Uh, the fact of the matter is, particularly if we look at earnings inequality, the main source of the increase in earnings inequality since 1980 in the United States and in many other countries has been the growing premium to various forms of skills, in particular higher education, here at the institute, a great institute, institution of higher education, Stanford. Uh, people who graduate from Stanford or Chicago and many lesser institutions are just doing a heck of a lot better now relative to high school graduates and high school dropouts than they did in the past. And that's true of all types of skill levels, on-the-job training, experienced workers, and the like. So another way to interpret that type of increase in inequality is to say the rate of return on investments in human capital have gone up. Uh, now, if somebody told John, uh, uh, John Gunn sitting there that the, he could get a higher rate of return on investments, he, would, he wouldn't say that's a bad thing, that's a good thing for the economy, it's a good thing for him, and it's a good thing for the economy. The same thing is true when the rates of return on, on human capital go up. That's a good thing for the economy. That means higher productivity in the economy. Now, the issue that arises is not the inequality issue per se, but why is it that so relatively few Americans have taken advantage of this booming market for higher education and for high school graduation, such that still 25% of the American population fail to graduate from high school. The same fraction has been true roughly for the past 30 years. So the problem, as I see it, is to uh, try to put into place a variety of policies that could increase the quality of education received at K-12, to such that the people will, first of all, will graduate in higher numbers, and they'll be better prepared to go on and benefit from the higher education. There are a bunch of things we could do. Um, you know, Head Start programs, uh, charter schools, vouchers, uh, trying to strengthen the family, an area that I've uh, uh, spent a lot of my time thinking about, and things of that type. But the leading quality per se is high rates of return. And we have to say, given that we have these high rates of return, how can we enable more people to take advantage of them? That's where the problem, I think, lies. So if that all made sense to you, then Gary's career has been a huge success. Because before Gary, the idea that education was capital, or human capital, and was akin to investment, and that education, uh, new education, could be considered like a new factory or a new uh, technology, that was considered radical before you, uh, you popularized that idea and wrote a famous book on it. 
So it all sounded perfectly natural to me to refer to the return to education as an investment in human capital, but it wouldn't have sounded very familiar 50 years ago or 40 years ago.